Good evening, friends. We are coming to the end of tracing this glorious story of our Savior. And we saw his announcement. And I want us to reflect tonight on the arrival of our Savior in this world. So turn with me to Luke chapter 2. And we'll be reading in verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In such a beautiful way, Luke describes for us the coming of Christ, this long-anticipated Son God now gives. But notice, we are already seeing just the traces of the kind of Savior that God is bringing. He has promised us a King. One who will sit on David's throne, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. And yet, there's no place for them in the inn. There's no room for a pregnant lady mother to give birth to her son. Nobody who's willing to open up their rooms for them. So they are relegated to the stables, to uh, probably a cave where the animals were kept and stored. And so he's laid in a manger. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, as they would do. And we are told that she had to travel quite a distance to get to Bethlehem. Here is no kingly arrival. Here is no glorious presence of David's long-expected son who would sit and reign on his throne over all the nations of the earth. Here's the arrival in obscurity. The real events was taking place in Rome. Caesar Augustus, he calls the shots. He says, census, everyone to your place of birth, and everyone has to go. Joseph, Mary, I don't care if you're that pregnant, you better travel. And yet, this is the glory of the story. God does not respond to Caesar's timetable. Caesar responds to God's timetable. Why was there a census? Because Jesus had to be born not in Nazareth, but in Bethlehem, the city of David, the birthplace of David. That's where God said the Messiah would be born. So how is he going to get the virgin who is with child? To Bethlehem. He uses the power that think he rules the world to get where God wants him to be. 
God is sovereign. And it makes me smile, isn't it? Because this is so typical of God. And that's our problem, isn't it? Because we see the people, we see the world events, and we find ourselves feeling so powerless. And yet we forget that the one who pulls the strings of all the rulers of the world is God himself. Like the proverb says, the heart of the king is in the hands of God. God rules his heart. He can't do anything without God's willing it, steering it, directing it. And so it is here. And so he comes into this world. And yet, where the world is ignorant, the heavens rejoice. And so we read in verse 8, And in the same region there were shepherds in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. There again, the beginning of the angel's communication, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. What a contrast. In the city of David, a Savior is born. Christ the Lord. Yahweh has come to be, say, to be the Savior and to deliver his people from their sin. And where will you see him? Wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. That's the Savior of the world. A baby? One who lives in utter dependence upon his mother's provision? Yes. Because we need to be saved, not from outside, but from inside our world. Because our problem is ourselves. And the beauty of the gospel is, is that Christ, the Lord, enters our world, enters not merely in our space and time to appear, but he literally becomes like us. He becomes human, fully human, so that he may save us by taking our place. And it is so perfectly clear. And that's why the angels marvel that the creator of the world would become a creature. That he who upholds the world will now become dependent. At the very moment he is still upholding the world. That he who rules is now submitting himself to his own law. To his own creatures in his parents. Stunning here. And so we read in verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God and in the highest and peace, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. What a wonderful, glorious moment that must have been where the angels rejoice. The shepherds, these 
people that were not very highly regarded. The shepherds were kind of uh, looked down upon. I'm sure they smelled from lying in the field and taking care of the sheep. And yet the, sh the angels comes to them, not to the palace, not to the royal uh, uh, families, no, to these people. Verse 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has been known. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that has been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The shepherds discovered that what was revealed from heaven is indeed the truth. And so they glorified God. You see, the moment we come and we see the glory of Christ and we believe what the scriptures says about Christ, we cannot help but burst out in glory of God. Because there's no, no one like Christ. Notice verse 21. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The angel said to Mary, you should call him Jesus. And here... As we are told, he is circumcised. They give him that name. Jesus means Savior. And in his circumcision, he is shown to be submissive under the law. The very law he has given, he now comes to uphold. And the fact that he gives uh, this and, and submits to circumcision, this sign and symbol of blood being shed, the need for blood to save. He says, I am coming to be for you all that you need. I will submit myself to the whole of God's law. Both in obedience and in taking the judgment for breaking the law. You see, we need a Savior who fully obeys God's law for us and one who fully pays the price for our sin. In theological language, we call it active and passive obedience. Christ was actively obedient in fulfilling all righteousness, keeping the law of God perfectly in our place, so that we can give uh, or receive in Christ perfect obedience. But not only perfect obedience, Christ also paid the penalty that our sin brought upon ourselves, the judgment of God for all our unrighteousness, for all the times we break God's law. And Jesus went to the cross, was forsaken by God, drinking the cup of God's wrath in our place, so that we, when we believe in him, may be granted the forgiveness of sins and the perfect righteousness of Christ, so that we can stand before God without blame, without blemish, knowing he receives us perfectly. That's what we rejoice in today. 
that from the beginning we have a Savior who saves completely. There is no one like Jesus and there is no one else that can save but Jesus. Believe in him. Believe, trust, rest, cast yourself completely upon him because in him alone there is life, eternal life for all who believe. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son. And we ask that you would help us to see and rejoice in him and rest completely in him for all our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord be with you and your family. Uh, have a blessed Christmas and a great New Year. Bye-bye.